Hello everybody and welcome to this video on Roddy Doyle's The Commitments. We'll be talking a bit about Irish history and the concept of the public. So the public, first of all, we'll be talking about in terms of the pub, public house. We're standing right in front of Fado, one of Austin's major Irish pubs. So we'll be doing some filming in there. We'll be talking about the idea of the pub in Irish history while we're in there. We'll also be talking about the public as in public housing. Okay, so here we are in a part of the pub called a snug. So a snug is an area within the larger pub that is more private. You can have some privacy within the snug. Sometimes they're, they're completely closed off and you have just like a little door that the bartender hands whatever you want through. Oh, Jesus Christ, Tommy, me fucking head. What's wrong with you? So a snug was always a part of the pub. So pub, the word pub, as I mentioned earlier, comes from the term public house. Public houses sprang up upon the roads um, in England and Ireland, mostly in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, the first usage that we know of the term pub as a public house, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, was in 1800, and it's very brief. It says, Mr. T slept at the pub. Not that Mr. T, obviously. Uh, we don't know who Mr. T was, but it was in a journal that was published, and that's the first usage. But the first time something shows up in print is obviously not the first time something has ever been said, okay? So it was in uh, colloquial usage before it worked its way into print. So in Ireland, the pub is a very important place. It's not just a place where people go to get drunk and act like idiots. It is that. People do that, certainly. Um, alcoholism is a very serious problem in Ireland. Binge drinking is a problem. All of these things. So not to deny any of that stuff. But it's also a place where people bring their families. And, and growing up with me, everything started and ended in the pub. Yeah. Everything from weddings, christenings, right. uh, funerals, some great after funeral parties. Seven pounds, 12 ounces. Seven pounds, 12 ounces. 12. Yeah, yeah, two arms, two legs and a head, right? <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic, love. No, I'm too bleeding happy. All right, see you later, bye. Good man. A lot of bars, there's always that one guy that after a few pints will break out into a song and right. all of a sudden you get the whole bar singing and people getting up and volunteering to sing and that, yeah. that, that was very, very common. That's why I always tell people who want to go to Ireland from here, where should I go? Mm -hmm. Rent a car and hit the small villages and towns right. because you're going to meet the locals. Mm -hmm. They're drinking that bar every day, every week. Right. Have their stools at the end of the bar, you know. Right. And right. Like, someone will tell stories, someone will sing songs. Mm -hmm. As far as the pub culture, I, I always thought, you know, I used to hate the stereotype here that we're Irish are all drunks and always drinking. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I think more, that's more because we're always seen in the pub. Who are your influences? Animal and the Muppets. I know. <laughs> oh, I used to play in a band in Kilbarnock. What did they do? The pitch mode, as they camera. That kind of sort of fucking art school stuff. What, the Beatles went to art school? It's all the drugs and music, and you've all their bleeding albums. It's who it's aimed at. Wankers with funny haircuts and rich stars with fuck all else do all day, but pricking around with synths. That sounds like me arse. <laughs> so you always went to the pub, and it, it wasn't always just because you were an alcoholic. It was, it was for the social gathering, as it were. You went down to the pub to meet your buddy, right. have a chit chat, or, or to hear the guys sing, or. or you know, to watch a fo football game, you know, but, uh, sure. but yeah, it's a whole different culture. And like you said, unless someone from here goes over there and visits it, it's hard to explain it. The hard as as in Ireland when I was growing up was family, I mean, the, the bar was full of parents with the kids running around who were playing in the parking lot, kicking the ball around, 
They mm. come in for a soda and a bag mm. of chips or whatever. Sure. Um, but the, the parents were all together in a car drinking. Right. And uh, that was a Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And that, that was, so I left 20 years ago. Those kids who are five years old are now right. 25. Right. You know, I, I go home and like, they know me from, remember me, as, mm -hmm. but I have no idea who are you, or so-and-so's son or so-and-so's daughter. Mm -hmm. But now they're drinking, or they're married with kids even, and they're, but, and, and they're doing the same thing. As you heard when I was talking with John O'Brien, the general manager of Fado, it's a place where all generations go to spend a day together, to spend a few hours together. The pub in Ireland for a long time has retained its sense as this place where the public comes to meet and gather. That's changing, um, sadly, as uh, John O'Brien was saying. One reason, one of course very good reason, is that there are uh, much stricter laws about dr uh, drinking and driving. Um, in my experience in Ireland, usually you would go to a pub that was within walking distance and nobody was driving. There were very few people who were getting around by car in Ireland. But Ireland has become a much richer country than it was before. And so modes of transportation have changed. All sorts of things have changed. You'll often hear in Ireland people complain that pubs in England aren't what they are in Ireland. Part of this gets to the difference between the two nations. And I think that difference has a lot to do, not everything, but a lot to do with Catholicism versus Protestantism. So Protestantism has to do with the individual. It really focuses on the individual's relationship to his God. In Catholicism, the individual relates to God and Jesus and Mary and the saints in communion. Communion is something that you see in the pub, you see it in various other aspects in the book, The Commitments. Notice that you often see a whole lot of people together doing something, whether it's playing music, whether it's being in a family, whether it's going on a vacation. There are all sorts of moments where the group is much more important than the individual. So I think that ties into the way the public plays out or the notion of the public develops in the novels of Roddy Doyle and really the novels of many Irish writers. We're in a place here where you see images of Irish writers everywhere. As you can see, this pub is really dedicated to the importance of the writer, the poet, the playwright, the novelist in Ireland, to James Joyce, to John Millington Singe, to Flannery O'Brien, to Brendan Behan, to William Butler Yeats. Their pictures are all over the place. Ireland is a land that prides itself on talking, writing, reading, poetry in general. We're standing in front of the Santa Rita Court Apartments. This is in East Austin. It's the first federal housing project built in the United States. The main reason that the first one was built here was because the congressman, when these were built in 1937, was Lyndon Baines Johnson, future president of the United States. He was an up and coming congressman. He had just won a special election to make him the congressman from this area. So in the 1930s, public housing was predominantly built for a very specific targeted population. And that population included folks who were in two-parent homes, who were white, and who were thought to be pre-middle class. So these are people who were almost middle class, who actually had a certain amount of means. And there was a heavy, very rigorous screening process, and so anybody who was not in that sort of family was weeded out, essentially, from being able to access public housing. And public housing wasn't stigmatized at the time. It was something that people really wanted. Um, these were low-rise units. These were very landscaped, very pretty units. Um, there were more amenities than what we think about as public housing today or in the 1960s. Um, but a lot of things shifted by the 1960s. So one was that there was some pushback from civil rights leaders saying, why can't other folks actually access these great public housing units and use that as a booster to get into the middle class? So, so when I think of the um, major housing projects in the United States, I think of things like Cabrini Green in Chicago. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid in New York, I, I remember driving past high-rise public housing on the east side of Manhattan, so that'd be East Harlem. What, what are some of the other places where, where these were? Well, generally in major cities, right? And so mm -hmm. in, in pretty much all the places, these were locations that were near the central city, not quite in the central city, usually in, a, in an area 
that had predominantly been occupied by working class folks or Afri and or African American populations prior to that. These are the areas that they that they saw as being really good money making opportunities that were low that were low cost to build on, but they could build these high rise units, these heavily packed dense units. Um, and get lots of money for doing that. So in Dublin, um, and we see this in the book, The Commitments, there's, um, there's a, there was a great amount of hope in the building of the projects in the 1960s. And by the time the book, The Commitments, takes place, the book we're going to be mm -hmm. reading in our class, um, that hope is gone. By, so by the 1980s, mm -hmm. that hope is gone. Do, do you see a similar trajectory having taken place in the United States? Yeah, to some degree. So. Initially, when public housing was first built in the 1930s, it, they were great. They were pretty good. Um, and the, again, the only people who really had access to them were some very specific populations who were, had more means than a lot of other folks at the time. But they were a good source of hope. And a lot of people who had them were able to use those sub, that subsidized housing as a means to jump into the middle class. But by the 1960s, it was no longer the public housing of the 1930s, right? Mm -hmm. Moving into a low-rise garden apartment is very different than moving into a place where you're stacked right on top of a whole bunch of other folks and where you don't, your living conditions aren't great, right? Mm -hmm. um, also, there were some other things happening in the 1960s that didn't necessarily have to do with, it wasn't the developer's thought, right. fault so necessarily. Things like um, white flight. White flight. Um, also, jobs had moved into the suburbs away from where public housing units were predominantly located, mm -hmm. and so it was really difficult for people to get jobs that would enable, enable them to get more resources and move into the middle class. So. Um, there were lots of different things that contributed to a situation where the public housing of the 1960s and 70s was not as, it couldn't be that source of hope in the same way that it could have been, it was in the 1930s. Public housing was built not just in the United States, but in other countries where there was a need to house large groups of low-income people. Dublin was one of those places. In Dublin, you had a long history of tenement housing. We saw in our earlier location, Fado, a picture of Sean O'Casey. Sean O'Casey set a lot of his texts in the Dublin tenements in the 19 teens and 20s. In the 1960s, Ireland did something very similar to what the United States did under Lyndon Baines Johnson as president. They started building public housing in high-rise buildings. In Dublin, what we see in the commitments are the Ballymun Towers. You definitely see them in the movie version of the, of the book. You'd see them talked about in the book Patty Clark Ha 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 by Roddy Doyle. Um, and you definitely see them implied in the book The Commitments. The Ballymun Towers have since been torn down. There was great cheering when these buildings came down because people recognized them as a blight. Since then, they've been rebuilding public housing in the same area but they've been adding the amenities that they meant to add in the first place. And they've also been building them as smaller sorts of buildings where the people can actually live out more complete lives. So it's a different world that's going on there now than was going on in the 1960s and that we still see very much in the 1980s in the commitments. 